Hey, howdy, everybody. So we have talked about Krieging, simulation. We've talked about the sequential Gaussian simulation approach for being able to capture continuous variables and be able to build realizations that have the right distributions and honor the variogram. We've also talked about the idea of the indicator formalism and approach for estimation and simulation, which was really cool. We got to locally estimate the CDF directly or the categorical PDF through a set of thresholds or categories. And that was pretty cool. Now, what we're going to do now, just to finish up the spatial concepts here, is we'll talk about simulation a little bit more, but dealing with specifically what are facies, and then talk about some additional simulation for facies methods that we have not covered yet that are also very important and are often used for reservoir modeling. So let's, first of all, let's put it all together. Let's talk about the overall workflow just to make sure that we all understand the context together. We have our categorical facies. We're going to simulate them first. And so we will build models, multiple realizations that honor the data and concepts of spatial continuity related to the facies, the categorical facies. Then within the facies, we will then simulate using a continuous simulation method such as sequential Gaussian simulation. The porosity, usually we'll go to porosity next. There could always be some other type of variable, maybe the shale, fraction of shale or something like that. But it's pretty common to go straight to porosity within facies. And there might be trends. You'll have information on spatial continuity. The trends might be very detailed. They might tell you about how things behave as far as porosity transitions or non-stationarities within the actual facies. As you can see in this example here, there's all kinds of beautiful trends that you have more higher porosity, which is the hot colors towards the center of these channel objects and towards the edges, they get cooler colors, they're lower porosities, and the overbank is going to be much lower porosity. And so you'll build up some type of a realizations of porosity within the facies. Now, the thing you should note is that within every realizations of a facies, of the facies, then there will be a realization paired for porosity so if you have 100 realizations of facies, you'll have 100 realizations of porosity built within the facies. Then you'll go ahead and do a form of co-simulation. And in a couple lectures, we'll spend some time talking about how we do co-simulation. But we're really going to simulate another continuous property, in this case, permeability, such that it is constrained or correlated with the porosity information. So we're building spatial models that are now accounting for also multivariate relationships. And this is very important, very powerful. And so we have facies. Within the facies, we are going to have porosity. And then within the facies, we will have permeability constrained such that we honor the relationship, that bivariate relationship, with the previously simulated porosity. And so this is the overall type of workflow but let's go back and talk more about facies. So what are facies? The most simple definition would be a method to categorize rock in a manner that's useful. What is useful for us in the subsurface? Well, it's a, it's a form of characterization, so it's actually telling us about the rock. It's allowing us to understand the rock better. That's important. That's helpful to us. But it also should aid us in making predictions away from the well locations or the data locations. If the facies don't help us with prediction, they're not very useful to us from the perspective of building models. And so we need that. So let's talk about different types of facies. Well, there's many different types of facies you could be working with. These are the ones that are most typical within subsurface modeling. Litho facies are going to be rock that has distinctly different petrophysical properties, permeability, porosity. They're distinctly different from each other. And so examples of that would be shale, sandstone, dolomite, limestone. 
Now, this is very useful, but at times lithophases may not have a lot of information with regard to geometry and prediction away from a well location. They might change too much too quickly. They might not have good correlations. It may be the case. So we may be concerned with depot faces, which is a bit of a compromise, a larger scale type of faces. They may have mixtures of lithophases in them. A depot facies could have multiple different types of litho lithophases within it, but it does provide a better, usually a better level of understanding about the three-dimensional shape or geometry, the prediction away from the well location. A good example of that would be channel, sheet, levy. These terms have built-in geometric expressions. We think of a channel and we would think of something like this. If we think about a sheet, then we would imagine a geometry more like this. These types of overbank type of sediments so that are less confined. They're not within a channel. So we have lithophases, depot facies, and we have seismic facies. And seismic facies may be an effort to use seismic information, acoustic impedance, elastic and uh, acoustic properties that we invert for in order to try to map directly rock type based on seismic. And so these methodologies may not be used as frequently in reservoir modeling directly, maybe as a form of secondary information. Of course, we use seismic. There's a variety of ways to use seismic information to get at facies. But you'll find that for reservoir modeling, depot facies are quite common, litho facies are sometimes used. You may find that, in fact, a model may have depot facies to describe geometry. And then within the depot facies, there may be actually litho facies. And then within the litho facies, there would be porosity and permeability. And so you could have a hierarchical model that, in fact, is combining multiple scales in order to build up the actual heterogeneity model. So let's just back up a bit here and make some general comments about facies. What are the things we can say? Well, facies or facies categories or rock type or rock categories are an important decision in subsurface modeling. It should remain a collaborative decision integrating the expertise from the variety of different disciplines within the project team. Geologists have an important stake when it comes to facies. They have a lot of information there, but reservoir modelers will, of course, understand the compromises and the requirements for facies within the model. The reservoir engineers, the petrophysicists, the geophysicists are all contributing their information to assist with the determination of facies. Once again, facies are rock type. They must improve the subsurface prediction away from the data or they don't add value. Characterization, just understanding what's going on with the rock and classification can be of use, but we need to combine that with the ability to make predictions in the subsurface. That's our grand challenge. The number of facies is a balancing act. If you use a lot of facies, many different facies, 20 different facies, for example, you'll have a high level of precision when it comes to separating the rock but you'll have very few samples within each facies in order to infer statistics, such as the porosity distribution, the permeability varigram, and so forth, the correlation coefficient between the two of them. And so we have to balance it. In addition, and if you use too few facies, what will happen if you're just using two facies, maybe, is that you'll mix a lot of different permeability and porosities and distributions, and you'll be mixing a bunch of different spatial continuity patterns into very large buckets, and you'll just start to kind of smear out the information. So once again, we get back to our old problem with binning, which we, we have run into many, many times. When we build a histogram, we decide on bin size. When we calculate a varigram, we decide on all the tolerances in the search, and so forth. It's that old binning problem again. In addition, with every additional facies. There's more work to build the model. The model becomes more complicated. Another point I made um, just, just now I, I made it was this idea that the reservoir modeling is hierarchical. And so you could have depot facies 
that are included within a unit of rock. And then the lithophases is within diphophases. And the porosity and permeability within the lithophases, you can work with many different scales or hierarchies, depending on what you need in order to characterize the right scale to answer whatever problem or question you're trying to answer with your reservoir modeling. 80 to 90 percent of flow heterogeneity is generally captured by facies. So where should you focus most of your effort? On facies. Then once you've got facies and you've done that well, the porosity and permeability, remember, is usually about 10 to 20 percent heterogeneity. There's a variety of different approaches for, for facies. We're going to talk, we already talked about the indicator-based methods. We're going to talk about multiple point simulation, and we'll talk about object-based in this lecture. So let's, let's just kind of summarize right now facies. I think this is very valuable. This table talks about the criteria for facies. This is how you decide what facies you should work with. And this is, this is useful. I, I like to share this so that people know when they design a facies scheme for a reservoir model that they're actually working with useful facies that can benefit the model, subsurface model. First of all, the first criteria, separation of rock properties. And so I draw schematically a permeability versus porosity scatter plot. And then I draw these circles and I say, well, if I'm going to have different facies here, they should have distinctly different groupings as far as porosity and permeability. If they overlap with each other completely, you now have facies that behave the same when it comes to flow. That will not be as informative or perhaps helpful. They should be identifiable in the data. If you come up with a facies scheme that is in fact based on high resolution information, say cores, but you've only got core information covering maybe 5%, 10% of the total lengths of well that transect the reservoir unit, then that's not very that's not very useful to you. You need to be able to identify the facies with the data that's available to you most, and that's usually well logs. And so they have to be identifiable in well log most of the time. They must be mappable away from data. If you come up with a type of facies that's just based on observations at the well locations and you have no more information about how it should behave between the wells, that's not useful to us. It has to aid with prediction. And sufficient sampling. We've hit up this before. Within each one of the facies you're going to have to be able to assess distributions and barograms, statistics that describe the behavior of porosity and permeability. If you don't have enough porosity and permeability within the facies, then you can't understand its petrophysical properties and it doesn't help you. So you have to have sufficient sampling within the facies in order to understand the behavior. So let's look at some models. So here's an example of a facies model. It is a categorical indicator-based simulation. It's from a, a paper in 2009 by Michael. And it is a pretty nice model. It's got, it's an indicator-based model, so it's going to be built based on indicator variograms. If you look at it, you'll notice the proportions are significantly different between the different facies. There is the possibility that there was some type of vertical trend here or transitions. Things seem to change vertically a bit, or maybe that's just because the long range is uh, vertically and it's a bit of a random effect. You'll notice that perhaps there's different spatial continuities between each one of the different facies. The black facies seems to be more maybe isotropic or so there's different things going on here but in general it's an indicator based simulation. So without going too far and trying to over interpret these models what we can say before sure is that the heterogeneity features will be based on the indicator variogram. So they will be linear faces, uh, linear features I should say that really result in kind of blobs, blobs with some pixelation and so forth. So that's the type of heterogeneity you get from an indicator-based methodology. Now here is an indicator-based simulation that I constructed, um, we put in the book with my co-author um, Clayton Deutsch, and we had built it with a variety of different trends in it. We were trying to capture this idea that on the rim 
of a carbonaceous platform that you would have a, a bound stone. We have more breccia down here and you have green stone, a lot more green stone kind of in the back in the calmer waters away from the, the edge of this platform. And so this is a indicator-based simulation with four different faces and there are distinct trends within the model to improve its realism to incorporate geologic information. This is another indicator-based simulation and it is constructed specifically for the example of more of a deltaic type setting. We have a transition of faces going from sandstone to interbedded to shale. Th that's interesting because these faces really are representing a continuous phenomenon. They're going from high porosity, coarse grains to worse, more kind of mixed, to something that's very shaly, low porosity, low permeability. The point with this model is that we used trends that, dis that are shown right here. You can see the two-dimensional trends and the colors are going from cold colors or low proportion hot colors are high proportion and so this is the trend for sand interbedded and shale and so what do we see here a higher proportion of sand about 50 percent sand in the core area kind of the the most uh, the most proximal part of the delta and then when you get m kind of more towards the basin it becomes more interbedded with about 50 percent 60 percent being interbedded much less interbedded in the proximal and much less interbedded in the distal part of the delta. And when we get to shale, we see a very low proportion of shale in the proximal part of the delta, but it gets very shaly as we get further out. Now, if you look really carefully, you'll in fact see that there's some cycles. I've shown a fence diagram. You'll see that this trend model is in fact a full three-dimensional trend and so there's some actual vertical cycles superimposed onto this aerial trend model. And so that was using the 3D trend modeling approach based on 1D plus 2D in order to do that. And we talked about that during the trend modeling lecture. So this is a nice little example right here where we built a categorical model, trend model to, to impose on this sequential indicator simulation. And here's a continuous indicator based simulation where we can see that we have a continuum of V-shale values, three different realizations, one, two, and three shown right here. And once again, this does illustrate this concept of the discontinuity across the continuous thresholds that was mentioned in a previous lecture. I believe we showed this exact example. Now, if I left the course right there and said nothing else about faces-based modeling, I would probably be negligent somehow because there's some, some techniques that are very different from the indicator-based method that are quite commonly used. Multiple point simulation and object-based simulation are quite frequently used. There's software available to use them. Um, Petrel has great MPS type of capabilities and object-based methods. A lot of people are using the object-based methods in Petrel. And so I want to go ahead and I'll explain these methods to you. You'll see that this is a whole new world. All of that geostats and talking about barograms and so forth, we are not going to do that right now. It's going to be very different. Okay, so what's the concept here? The general concept of the barogram may be extended beyond two points. We had a barogram before and if we imagine that we're working with a gridded phenomenon, so we have cells shown here and we have a lag vector H1, we could calculate the varogram for any possible distance and orientation. And that's what we did with the varogram model. Well, it turns out that concept can be extended. And so now what do we have is where we had one tail and one head, we can have one tail and we can have many heads. And so this was a two-point statistic describing tail to head. We could have a one, two, three, four, five-point statistic describing from a tail 
to five different heads that are offset as described by four separate lag vectors h1 through 4. Now this this is very cool and, and what we could do is we could use this type of a template to try to calculate a conditional probability. We want to know what's the probability of a specific categorical outcome at the tail location given this data configuration and when I say data what I really mean is this configuration of these whatever is going on at these other locations it could be previously simulated values it could be actual hard data using that information how do we inform what's going on here and so the point is that you may recall from all that varigram work before that it was very difficult to calculate a varigram in fact we had an excel example with i think 60 data and we still struggled to get a two-dimensional varigram much less a full three-dimensional varigram and so it makes sense that if you're going to go beyond two points and now you want to describe what's going on over a five-point template or a 20-point template or maybe like a 50-point template or even more, we would not be able to do that from the typically available density of data. So this results in a paradigm shift where we say, let's borrow the statistics from what we will term a training image. We'll borrow the statistics. Now this is very interesting because this is where we get into more of an image reproduction problem. We've got a training image, we extract statistics from it to put into our resolve model, as opposed to the statistical data-driven approach that we've been doing, where we calculate our spatial continuity from the data and we try to impose that into our model. So what does MPS look like? Well, here's the simulation model. We're trying to simulate in this model. This is the location we're trying to simulate. It uses the same sequential method that we had before. So these locations may be well data, or they may be previously simulated nodes. Okay, and I haven't really populated the rest of the model, but just imagine this simple problem. We've got nodes one through four, and we got an unknown location right here. What you do with MPS is you go to your training image. The training image has no location specific information. You can't, this training image, you can't put the wells in here. You can't give it a coordinate and say that that's at a certain location within the reservoir. No, the training image is just a pattern. It's at the same scale as the reservoir model you're building, but there's no local information here. There's nothing constrained by local data. It's not conditioned to data. It's just simply going to be the patterns you want to extract and put into your reservoir. Kind of cool because instead of actually modeling a varigram, instead you build an image and then you try to put the image into your model, which is I, I think is very cool. Okay, so what we do is we take those head locations where we have, where we know the categories for instance, we have location one and two both have light gray. Three and four have dark gray. That's our data event. We'll call that a data event. It's the template, a data template. And so we'll go ahead and take that template and scan it through this image. We scan all possible locations. And if you do that, I think you'll find that only this location, this location, and this location have that pattern. So what's very cool is we put on our frequentist hats and we just do some counting to try to figure out the conditional probability of what should happen here given what's happening here. Okay, first time, light gray, light gray, dark gray, dark gray. Unknown location is light gray. Light gray, light gray, dark gray, dark gray. Unknown location, light gray. That's two out of two. Light gray, light gray, dark gray, dark gray. Ah, unknown location, dark gray three occurrences of this pattern, one time out of three, dark gray at the unknown location, two times out of three, light gray at the unknown location. The probability distribution at this unknown location will now be two-thirds light gray category, one-third dark gray category. And so now from MPS scanning from a template, 
we were able to calculate a local conditional PDF, CDF that, that we can now do Monte Carlo simulation from, place in the grid, and work sequentially, just like we did with sequential Gaussian simulation. Now let me just make a couple of comments about the training image. First of all, the training image is, I've said this before, it's unconditional. There's no data constraints within the training image. This image right here, there was no data. It just had the patterns that we want to put into the model. Stationarity, stationarity is critical, just like it was with variogram-based methods. You assume stationarity. It gets a little bit more slippery when we're dealing with MPS because we could put in a training image like this that in fact is highly non-stationary. Look at the proportion of yellow or channel lag versus lateral accretion versus brown mud plug. They're all very different at different locations. There is a huge amount of non-stationarity in this training image. If you try to use that to build an MPS realization given data constraints, what you will find is that you get something that will not look like that training image. You have to put some type of additional constraints in it to tell it, oh no, there's only going to be channel features in one part of the model. Or there, we'd expect to see more mud plug in another part of the model. This training image would be very difficult to capture without probably a lot of cons local trend constraints to impose certain features in cer certain locations. And that would become a very deterministic model. So it may not be very practical to work with this type of training image. I don't want to I don't want to go any further on the topic. Of course, there's a lot of research into other methods using auxiliary variables and so forth, but that would be out of scope for this simple course. So I'm not closing the door. I'm just saying we have to be concerned about stationarity. Once again, there's no location information within the training image. You can't take this location here and say that, in fact, it's this location in the actual model that you're building. The fact that this is 15 kilometers by 15 kilometers by 50 meters, the same as the model we're building, is coincidental. In fact, you could build a training image that was twice the size of the model. You could have a totally different coordinate scheme. The coordinates don't matter. It's you're scanning through the image looking for patterns. Only the simulated categories should be present. That makes perfect sense. If I'm building a model, and I don't use overbank or mud plug or any of these other faces in the model. Of course, when you scan through, if you encounter faces that are not in your model, that will cause confusion. That won't work very well. So here's an, here's an example right here, a pretty good example of multiple point simulation. We have the training image down here. It was built by an object-based method. It's just a nice regular training image. Looks pretty good. It's got some nice patterns in it. And here's the MPS model up here. So what do you observe? Well, first of all, it should look very much different than what we saw with indicator-based methods. I hope I can convince you that there's a lot of nonlinear type shapes and ordering relationships that are captured in this image. First of all, yellow is most common inside the orange faces. Sandstone is surrounded by interbedded sandstone and shale. If you look at the simulated realization up here, we in fact captured that feature. Green doesn't touch yellow very often. The other thing is that we have kind of these teardrop shapes here. If you look here, we actually have pretty good teardrop shapes too. So we're doing pretty well. It's a pretty powerful method. Now, of course, we can do a lot with non-stationary trends. And so here we have a, a, a model, an MPS model that was constructed using locally variable azimuth. So we said the training image in the middle of the model oriented like this towards one model, spin it this way, towards the other side, spin it this way. And if you look, you have a little bit of a distributory pattern. Things are going out this way here, straight here, down dip here, and over to the side over here. Kind of a deltaic pattern. Things tend to all move out. They have a distributory pattern. We could also do locally variable azimuth and scales. What we're doing is we're taking the training image, rotating it locally, but we're also rescaling it. So we end up with the bigger lobes up front, proximal, and then deeper basinward. We have 
smaller objects shown right here. So we can do that type of a trend model too. And of course we can get much more complicated with it. We could start combining locally variable azimuths, locally variable scales, and combine into it the concept of locally variable proportions of sand, interfeded, and shale, like we did with the deltaic indicator-based simulation. Now, we're getting to the point where we have so many constraints on this model, of course it's getting to be, um, it can get a bit noisy. You can notice that individual constraints might be hard to see. I personally think we could be reaching a point where we're starting to lose some of the geometric information in order to reproduce all of this, so many different trends and local variable scale and azimuth all at once. How do we make a training image? You could draw one. You could in fact just draw one. In fact, this image right here was drawn by a good friend of mine, Sebastian Schrebel. I worked with, worked with him at Chevron. He's well known in the MPS world. And it's funny, he drew it in order to do some basic MPS testing, drew it in 2D. And it ended up being this model that was used all over the world in so many different papers and cited. And so we could draw. We could draw our models. You could use satellite information. I had um, students back when I was at Chevron, I worked with at different schools who were using satellite imagery. And here's an example right here from Sarah Baumgardner, who received her PhD from Minnesota under Chris Paola. And we also have geophysical information. You could invert. You could calibrate to try to interpret some type of geometries and features and forms that could be used. That could be the way you do it. You could also use unconditional object-based simulation. And this, honestly, is the most common way that people build training images. Um, Misha Marharja actually had a really nice paper in computers and geosciences years ago where she was demonstrating a really flexible methodology to build up um, these training images directly from unconditional object-based models. And so they can be very simple, or they could be even more complicated with all kinds of non-stationaries and features. My personal opinion, and what I've seen in practice, is that it's better to have a simple training image and then to include the non-stationarities like we showed before, where you have locally variable proportions, locally variable azimuths, and so forth. So forth. Okay, we're going to cover object-based modeling right away, so don't worry too much about object-based modeling. We'll show this example right here. The paper reference is, the link to the paper is shown right here or to the, the online resource. And so we have a nice set of multiple realizations of indicator simulation and multiple point simulation where both of the models were built carefully using the available data and so forth. And what you can see is very interesting. The indicator based simulation in general is more pixely, more broken up. They tend to do that. It's blobs. If you see nonlinear features in an indicator based simulation and there wasn't a trend model imposing it, that means that it's likely just luck. You just happen to have here a blob of green, blob of green, blob of green that just happened to line up and form what looks like a nonlinear feature. Now, if you look at the MPS model right here, what you're going to see is that you have a little bit more nonlinearity going on here. It's cleaner. You have nesting of the facies. You can see that there are certain facies that are clearly acting within other facies. That's happening too. And so th that's a pretty good example of MPS. What are the problems? Well, everything has problems. There's always going to be some disadvantages, right? The first thing is that there potentially could be discontinuities. You could put a training image like this, that famous Sebastian Trebel training image, give it conditioning data. And as Claude Cavalis and Sebastian Strabel showed in their 2013 paper, you get systematically discontinuities. You get things broken up. They modified the MPS approach to try to improve this. And so to some degree, there have been improvements with these discontinuities, but it's not perfect. So some people are interested in improving the geologic realism within reservoir models. They want to, in fact, very explicitly constrain geometries in the model because that is the fundamental plumbing to the reservoir, these geometries. These geometries, these geologic shapes, do exist within nature. If you go to rock outcrop, 
you'll find fluvial channels that are cutting into aeolian dunes covered by lacustrine de lake deposits on top, shaley type of materials, and a really nice coarse fluvial channel just sitting there with its distinct shape and geometry. You can track them in the rock record. We commonly see this in shallow seismic. These channels can go on for miles and miles and miles, and they're very distinct features, and we, we know something about them. And so when we, when we know the geometry, and we can parameterize the geometry like a channel by its width, its thickness, some type of sinuosity or something, then we probably want to put that into the model. And so, in addition to that, often those geometries can be informed by a lot, a lot by our knowledge about the depositional processes involved. If it's a mass flow, it's um, carried by water, there's um, fluvial processes then, if it's um, deep water turbidity currents, it's things that are trapped in suspension, and are traveling due to the apparent density increase with that, um, with the grains in the water column. All of those things have certain known types of behaviors, and so they result in different types of shapes that are predictable. And so, by working directly with these shapes, we're able to, in fact, put our process knowledge into the model. And so. That's the idea with object-based modeling. We know the shape, we parameterize the shape, we put heterogeneity within the shape, and we may even know the relationships between the shapes. Here's an example of a deltaic model in which we built it, going back again to the book, we built it where we had objects that described not the reservoir, but the non-reservoir. The shale drapes were being modeled as these distinct kind of lobe type shapes and we were able to place those statistically. And so these object-based models can be very powerful. We have very nice continuous shale drapes, which are acting as barriers or baffles, and we can now understand and explore them. In fact, this object-based approach is so good at understanding the subsurface and flow behaviors that authors like Willis, Tang, what they've done is they publish a really nice paper in which they took a whole bunch of different object stacking patterns for fluvial, for river deposits, and they ran a streamline-based simulation on it, and they were able to assess the behavior as far as different types of channel stacking patterns for rivers, and the recovery factor, the flow, whether or not there was going to be bottlenecks, whether or not there was going to be large sheets over which you'd be able to recover large volumes, and so forth. And so this is very powerful. And why are we motivated to go to object-based methods? Because as we saw before, pixel-based methods, indicator, MPS, and of course all of the Gaussian methods are limited in their ability to capture geometry. Here's a nice example shown right here. We got object-based shown right here. You can see persistent shoestring type of features, channels. If you come over here and look at the MPS model that was using a training image with channels, you can see that things are getting broken up. There's, there are some channels, but you don't have that persistent channel form. You don't get the geometry as accurately as you would with object-based modeling. And there's many different ways to parameterize the objects. Lobes, channels, bars, dunes, levees, different shapes, cross-sectional geometries that can be attached to each other. You can make them so that they're very smooth. You can make them so they're sinuous and irregular. You can put internal trends within them. There's so much you can do. You can control the stacking pattern. They're random. They repulse each other. They're clustering to each other. They're non-stationary. They're distributary. They're dispersive. And you can also build up raster templates to speed up the methodology or complete functional forms so that the parameterization becomes very light, there's not a lot of parameters required, and the calculations become very quick. You can place these objects in the model and build the model very, very quickly. They can be very powerful method, methods. And so here's an example, another example from the book where we have a set of stack channels with channel axis and channel off axis or margin in orange where we have poor quality faces and then overbank in between the channels. The overbank is transparent so you can see through the model to all of the channels.
And so these are pretty powerful methodologies. Now, I should mention, I should be talking about the fact that these models are harder to condition to wells and to full three-dimensional trends. And that's, undoubtedly, that's the case. If you have channels or any type of object that's large relative to the spacing of the well data, you will, in fact, have a lot of trouble getting really good conditioning or match to the data at the data locations. MPS, it was a sequential method. You sequentially placed the, you sequentially placed the new simulated values in the model, but before you started, you put all of the well data in first, and so you guaranteed that you would honor the well data. So I should, I should, talk, I should just mention that right now, that that's one of the drivers for which people would prefer maybe MPS. You get some of the geometric information, but you can honor detailed trends and so forth. Just a couple of more comments. Of course, this example from the book, again, where you can see object-based modeling with a nesting of hierarchies. And so you remember with the barograms, we're nesting different spatial frequencies. Well, you can nest different objects. And so you could imagine that you take the, you could go ahead and you could simulate individual channels within a channel complex or channel belt, depending on what hierarchical scheme you use. And then you'd have multiple of these belts within some larger scale. I don't know if that would be a complex set or something, some other terminology. And so we'd keep moving up through the scale. So we'd be able to capture all of these individual features at different scales simultaneously and consistent with each other. All right. So admittedly, this was a very kind of very soft overview of the concept of faces. MPS, multiple point simulation, and object-based simulation. There's so many other things we could have talked about. We really included this here just to provide a little bit of context to allow anyone who's taken this class to have some familiarity. I should put together at some point more complete lectures where we get into the theory, many more of the objects, advantages, disadvantages of these types of methodologies along with the references. I'll put that something like that together later but this will have to suffice for right now for this class. All right, as usual, I hope that this was useful to you. I'm open to any type of suggestions or questions anytime. I can be reached at the University of Texas at Austin, where I am associate professor. Um, also on Twitter, I'm the Geostats guy. All right, thank you. Take care. Have a happy Thanksgiving.